Hey everybody, Gordon Titsworth here from Images of Eden and you are watching the Crash Course YouTube channel with our local homegrown press guy Trevor Crash Knight here in York, PA. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Crash Course Metal Show. I'm your host Trevor Crash Knight and today we got a very, very cool guest. One that uh, I am familiar with, with the uh, albums that and the band that he's been in ever since uh i guess you could say the late 80s and but i know him from the album from 1992 but we will get to that but we have here today mr drew rose and i guess some people would know as drew hannah as well uh from Wildside. how are you doing my man hey trevor thank you i'm doing great thanks for having me of course of course uh a pleasure to have you so uh definitely we want to get into uh all the the wild side stuff uh all that all that juicy stuff but certainly do you mind just kind of telling the fans uh like kind of like what you're up to now uh basically uh obviously while side hasn't really released anything for many many years and just kind of give a quick update on how uh, drew's doing today well you know ever since the band broke up i've been homeless um no actually um sad stories yeah, it's a sad story no um well what i'm doing these days is something i've been doing for a long time um i work in the uh, adult entertainment business i've been doing that for a, gosh i don't know 20 years maybe okay. yeah something like that um uh i started doing that God, uh, things with music weren't like moving in the direction that I wanted them to. I got caught up in a lot of things that probably helped that movement slow down quite a bit, a lot of drugs and, um, just found myself a bit lost and just sort of stepped away from, um, the music business and started working more in the, um, um, uh, film business, the regular film business. Mm -hmm. I was doing that um, on locations in different parts of the world. Um, and and then ultimately found myself back in Los Angeles, where I'm from. And um, I don't know, with some influence, all of a sudden, I was making a, my own um, adult films, <laughs> which <Okay>. is, <laughs> which is a big departure from rock and roll but um with you know sort of getting familiar with that and realizing that it was more business instead of just you know having fun with all the um you know i don't know girls in the adult business it, it mm -hmm. became a real business that made real money and um you know after doing it for a while i went to work for some um, big companies and um, I continue to do that now. I'm an executive at a major company in the adult business. And, um, and that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, okay. uh, you know, hopefully it's not offensive to anybody out there listening, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at these days. Interesting. And that's not an answer that we hear every day. So that, that's certainly, that's certainly a one of a kind. Well, maybe not necessarily one of a kind story, but an un uncommon story, I would say, uh, for somebody yeah. coming from but then again so much like you hear the stories from back in the 80s and like on the sunset strip and stuff like it was debauchery it was uh the city of sin i guess you could say and yeah. anything kind of goes yeah right anything goes and and you find yourself in the middle of um the whole the whole the whole thing with with my music career and um you know sort of the very 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 tail end of what was still wild side even if it was a different version of it um mm -hmm. it was miserable and um and i got out, out of being miserable and depressed i found myself just wanting to drown in you know drugs and 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 got really hooked on some bad things and and literally tried to escape run, running around I, I left the country i was living in you know, Australia for a while. I was, okay. I was, I was just trying to get away and everywhere I went there, I was right. That's the old saying. And, um, <laughs> um, I couldn't get away from myself you know, because I was so frustrated and ultimately it had nothing to do with music anymore. It was just me being so messed up. And, um, right. you know, 
try and, and ultimately trying to make a living. You know, when you, when you're in music for as long as I was, I was, you know, that's how I made a living. That's what I did to, to pay the bills. And, yeah. um, and at one point it was much more than paying the bills. It was, there was a lot of money. And so to go from all of that to now to like, how do I, how do I pay the rent? Um, I took a couple of jobs and before, before I knew it, I was working on a movie set and then a TV series and then another movie set. And then all of a sudden I was, Oh, I'm in the movie business now, you know, and I wasn't singing anymore. I was so busy trying to keep the bills paid and the older you get, you know, mm -hmm. the harder it is to, um, get back to it and, right. you know, okay, we're going to play music at night while I work all day. And it just, you know, and, and it, it took a long time, you know, it took a long time to, um, come to terms with that, you know, and, um, cause it was years of drugs. It wasn't like, you know, I tried this for three months and, yeah. <laughs> and then got out, but you know, and, and I, I ended up, I don't remember exactly how it went down, but I ended up meeting a couple of people who were making some adult movies and they were making some real money. And I was already, uh, working in the industry where I knew cameramen and I knew all the right guys. And I put all these people together and I said, oh, we're not going to make a regular movie today, guys. We're going to make this kind of movie. And, <laughs> and then it wasn't long before I was making a lot of those. And I started my own company and pretty soon I was distributing those. And then I had a business partner and we launched a bigger company. And then I got recruited by Hustler magazine to go to work for them. So oh, yeah. I was, working there for a really long time. I got married, I started having kids, and then I went and got recruited by a, another adult um, magazine called Penthouse Magazine. And yeah. uh, so that's where I am now. I've been here for years. And, um, but I work remote, the company's in Los Angeles and I work, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in Florida. So I work remote. I, I left LA about five years ago for Nashville, ironically. And um, I was living in Nashville for a while. And, I, and after the pandemic, we just packed it up and came to the Florida. We, we got, we wanted to get back to the beach. And so we're down here on the beach and uh, we live here now. And that's kind of what I'm doing. But I'm also doing this uh, sort of side gig because, you know, I'm always close to music somehow. Right. Um, and that's my um, YouTube channel that I run with um, the drummer, the drummer from Wildside. Um, and Jim Darby. And so he and I decided that, you know, let's, um, let's try to put a documentary together about what happened to wild side and see how far we get with it. And again, being connected with all these, um, production people that I've been with for 20 years, you know, different people, I was able to bring a crew to, together and shoot things professionally. Mm -hmm. And, um, and get it all edited the way we wanted it and everything to look really slick. And, um, and then we, we began to realize that, you know, nobody really cares about a wild side documentary. Maybe you do, maybe you do. Trevor, <laughs> I, 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 certainly do. You know? I certainly do. But in the big picture of things, and, and we always are looking at something, you know, from a, from a big gainful financial and also right. exposure, you know, it didn't make a lot of sense to put that kind of effort into something like that. So, um, we decided to let's let's go out there and interview our friends and people we know and talk about their careers and see what kind of stories we can come up with and um, and and put those out there either um, in a documentary or eventually on YouTube. And so it ended up on YouTube and um, we shot tons of them and um, they're out there. They're on our channel called 80s Metal Recycle Bin and um we have had a really good time doing it a really good time i was i was gonna say i, I watched uh, plenty of those videos and it feels like you guys are having a good time the artists are always in a really good mood answering the questions like there's always fun questions being asked as well uh mm -hmm. it's a great channel i will put the link in the description as well for 80s uh 80s metal recycle bin is it, it's a really good idea and it's new it's it, it's like a perfect avenue for you to kind of keep like what you grew up in alive, like the scene that you were like, cause you know, firsthand what it was all about and you know, the artist to get and who can tell some of the wildest stories. So that, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a good time. We went on the, uh, a couple years ago, um, 
we went out on the Monsters of Rock cruise and we interviewed mm -hmm. some guys there. We've done countless interviews in hotels all over the country. Um, and so we just will get on a plane and wherever they're playing and go meet up with them at a hotel and bring a camera team and some lighting and sound and, and, and try to make it look super professional and, and make it look slick and cut it that way. And I think it came out really nice. Uh, so, and we continue to do it. It's just, it's not easy to do that, you know, <laughs> where, you know, it's much easier and I'm not saying what you're doing is easy, but it's much easier to go, Hey man, I'll meet you online and we'll do this thing. That's sort of, you know, with a split screen and, and do that. But, um, yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we're, so that's what I'm doing. Otherwise I'm, so I'm, so I'm working with this company and, um, and then I'm also, you know, kind of doing that as a, as a fun thing on the side. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so quick question before we jump into the time machine and go back into the 80s. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you like the uh, movie entertainment side better than the music entertain entertainment side? Like what which kind of do you love more or is it kind of one of the same to you? You know, um, I've been struggling with that a lot lately. Um, I think that's a great question because for a long time, I really did enjoy working in the entertainment business, although it's adult, but you know, it gets, it, it, you know, you, you can get a lot of creativity out that way as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. spent years doing a lot of the music, um, tapping friends to, you know, help me record music for some of the stuff that we've done. And, um, the, the business has come a really long way and I, but I've stepped away from being the guy on the set going, okay, cut. All right, honey, you need to move your leg a little this way. Yeah. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I'm more behind the scenes on an executive side, managing a big staff and, and traveling a lot from, um, um, well, from Florida to LA, but then also from uh, where I live now to Europe, you know, and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a different perspective. And what I do miss a lot um, about the music business is is definitely not the business. I, I could care less yeah. about the business because it's right. it's so different now. But um, uh, is the performance? You know, I enjoy um, the connection with the audience and the. Um, just the just the sheer energy of the performance on stage and we've done we did some shows you know it's been five plus years now since we've done those but when we did do those shows um sort of as a, a reunion thing mm -hmm. um it was great it was a lot of fun we had a great time getting together as as uh, old friends as well as um having some great memories of being back up on the stage again so and and it's great to see people sing along after you know 20 years um the 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 you know the songs with us so is that that kind of impact just leaves a really strong mark on me right and uh, obviously because like i it even with like your debut album under the influence i was only three days old when that came out in 92 I, don't know, I could I couldn't I so sadly I couldn't go out and buy it right away yeah so, but yeah I mean it, it's just how old are my, you? uh th I just turned 31 okay yeah. and you um and when did you discover this album uh so I was probably in like 10th grade so it's been 15 years since I've had this album here okay uh, under the yeah. influence and obviously your second one here as well uh, but yeah, it, it's been because even some of my friends in high school, they love Wild Side because uh, I told one of my buddies, hey, I, I might be interviewing Drew here short in, in the near future. And he was like, dude, that's so badass. And like so, so even kids in my class of school, like they knew who Wild Side are. And I know that's kind of crazy to say because like everyone's all like, yeah, Guns and Roses, you know, Motley Crue. But I'm like, uh, there's there's some better stuff out there than those guys not taking anything away from those guys. Yeah. Those but, are great. I mean, those are great bands, but yeah, I, I get it. It's cool to discover your own little thing and be into it. And maybe not yeah. so many people know, you know, but um, cool. Yeah, exactly, man. So let's jump into the time machine, if you will. So can you kind of like take us back to 
when kind of Wild Street or sorry, Wild Side started basically as uh, like Rouge and then kind of like going through the Young Guns with uh, yeah. You did now with the Young Guns, real quick. Did you guys release any like demos? Uh, because that's what like like on this Stevie Rochelle compilation here that he put out. Uh, like you had a uh, sweet little sister dance, uh, swing and city of love. Like we're, you can get to that once we get the young guns, but it was that kind of like, just like a couple demos that you guys did. Yeah. So I think you're referring to earlier than that, uh, a band called rogue and I was in a oh, band. Rogue. So okay. rogue, yeah. and that was really not much of a, a wild side or young guns rendition. That was just, um, the guitar player, Benny and I, we had been playing together um, in, uh, you know, sort of pop cover bands up in uh, Seattle where we lived. That's where right. I originated uh, with him. And, um, and so we were playing, you know, uh, bars and playing um, frat parties and playing wherever we could get a gig on a Friday or Saturday night. And we were pretty much busy every weekend, you know, mm -hmm. all the time getting our chops down and, and sort of figuring out, you know, what, you know, what we wanted to do. And we, after a while, we started to realize that we wanted to write our own material and, and started playing around with our own songs and our own ideas. And, and then, you know, asked the rest of the guys in that band, if they would like to move to Los Angeles with us, because we heard the whole scene down in LA. Now this was, um, gosh, it was a long time ago. Um, but you know you weren't even i i i would bet your parents were still in high school well, this was in 19 uh like 85 84 85 so you know it was really early and we were trying to uh get ourselves down to LA because there was a real scene happening on the sunset strip as everybody knows and and so Benny and I took a road trip down there to see you know what was happening and we were just so wow this is where we have to be this is who we want to you know uh this, these are the these are the the group of musicians we want to you know kind of come together with in these clubs down here and and then um we asked the guys if they wanted to go and everybody agreed yeah let's go down and and so we took a convoy of of cars and and moved to la where i had some relatives and we just crashed on couches and floors for a while until we had enough money to get an apartment we all lived in the same place you know everybody's got the same story right. we were all eating top ramen and we were all you know trying to collect 50 bucks just to go out for the night and you know stuff like that and and this went on for um a couple of years while again we were we were writing songs and that was rogue and okay. then rogue started getting booked in places like um you know the roxy or you know the whiskey or some of these places and and it was a big fail it wasn't really um what i felt would be my final like this is the you know you kind of know when you think you've got something going on mm -hmm. you know and and, right. and it's something special and um so benny and i kept struggling with what to do about all of this and um and ultimately those guys packed up and left except for he and I, they all went home back to Seattle. And so Benny and I were bouncing around. What do we do? And, and at the rehearsal studio where we were, I saw that, um, Brent Woods, mm -hmm. who's, uh, was our guitar and it was the guitar player in wild said the other guitar player. Um, he was in another band rehearsing in the same rehearsal studio that we were at. And, okay you know, conversations, a few conversations later, we decided, you know, let's, let's kind of put a piece of his band together. And then Benny and I, in other words, he, he let us borrow a, a bass player and a drummer from his band. And we would sit and jam after his band was done okay. and write and write songs. And so some of the early demos that were eventually young guns are some of those songs and um like sweet little uh sinner and some of those songs were all songs that you know brent and i wrote while we were trying to figure out if we were even going to play together honestly and okay. after we recognized that we were great writers together and we you know felt like we had something stronger than what even he had going on with his band and obviously what I was doing with Rogue, 
let's put this thing together and call it something. And we didn't worry about a name for a while. We just started writing songs and we were rehearsed and rehearsed and wrote and did all that. And then finally, you know, we felt like we had the right guys in a band and we called it young guns. And then we set out to go after a major record deal and write material and, and get, you know, get noticed basically. Right. Yeah. Very cool. So you do end up getting picked up by Capitol, then, correct? Um, and to do the 1992 Under the Influence here? Yeah. Very good album. Uh, 12 total songs on here. Every like, I don't think there's any uh, filler on this album. This is, if I had to rank of like the dirty hair metal or even just the whole hair metal genre of 92, that would that that album it would probably be my favorite or at least top three album for me. It, it the guitar tone, your voice, every everyone's playing is really good. Sounds awesome. I'm not just saying that because you're here. You know, I'm not say, saying that because sure. obviously it's been a part of me for 15 years now, and it, it hasn't left my my side. So it's very awesome. Well, and thanks. I heard I heard a little uh, rumor. I don't. Maybe you can clarify for me with this album. Did you guys do any recording in Eddie Van Halen's home studio mm -hmm. on this? Okay, that that's awesome. Wow, you're amazing, dude. Can you kind of like delve into like how that kind of happened? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, it was a big secret at the time because there was a lot of stuff going on with um, LA County, Los Angeles County um, and how people were able to run home studios versus um, it's one thing to build a studio at home and just record and do your thing there, but to do it in a way that you're actually going to, you know, maybe make money with it. There were a lot of, um, you know, all kinds of um, regulations and obviously laws and taxes and things like that you would, you know, have to pay for. And it was something that came up really, really last minute. And we were um, sworn to secrecy, you know, it's a big deal. You can't do this. You know, it was, it was weird. And so we ended up, um, we ended up, uh, uh, as you mentioned, getting uh, signed to Capitol Records and began the whole long process of putting all the songs together and picking a producer and and then ultimately going to record the record. And um, the producer was Andy Johns. Andy Johns had done, you know, a lot of rock records, including going f as far back as working with Led Zeppelin and right. Rolling Stones and The Who and, and some of those super classic you know, uh, amazing records. And, and that's why we chose him because we felt like, you know, we really wanted that kind of, you know, analog raw sound where a lot of bands were kind of leaning in the digital space early on. We right. still were big believers in, you know, raw tape <laughs> yeah. and he was that guy. And, um, he had just, uh, well, I guess he was halfway or almost through with the Van Halen record that he was working on that time, which was the, uh, for, for unlawful carnal knowledge. And so, Correct. yep, yeah. So we met with him and, and, and decided to move forward with Andy. And, um, and I remember we were rehearsing, uh, the new songs or, or writing or working on some material at a big sound stage that, you know, we had set up prior to the record and Andy would come down and help us with some of those songs and say, okay, change this, do that. Or I like this, leave it the way it is. And one day unannounced, he brought Eddie with him oh, and wow. the two okay. guys walk in and we're in the middle of playing a song and we are like tripping, like, Oh my God, you know, you know, and, and we finished the, the song and, and, and sat and talked with Eddie for a while. And, um, and the conversation led to something about, you know, where we were going to start recording the basic tracks and then where we were going to move to um, do anything else or if we were going to stay there. And I think there was some sort of suggestion about recording at, uh, you know, his house, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I it, it's hard to remember that far back. But ultimately, 
a few phone calls later, after we had spent a few weeks at another studio, we were going to pack it up and move up to Eddie's house. And, and, you know, a lot of people think that that was like amazing, right? Oh my God, you're going to, you know, the King, right? And he, yeah. and he, and he was, you know, I mean, I grew up as Van Halen as being the one of the most important, you know, musical influences of in my life and, and sat and stared at, album covers of Eddie and David Lee Roth for, for hours listening to the music over and over and over and trying to figure out what was going on. And also um, reading every liner note, you know, and just yep. fantasizing about what it would be like to be them as a kid, you know, and went to every concert, Benny and I would wait all day and night to get tickets, you know, and, and, and be up front for every, Van Halen show. And so it was very surreal to be in a car, you know, that very first day driving up to Eddie's gates of his home in the, in, you know, in, uh, in the Hills in Hollywood and then push the button and somebody say, you know, come on in, you know, and the big <laughs> right. gates open up, you know, and, and you driving up the driveway and the driveway is lined with, you know, Ferraris and uh, all these uh, expensive cars and a golf cart that's all red with white stripes <laughs> all over it, you know, and just, it was just a trip. And then get up to the studio and go inside and, um, and start working on a record. And, you know, Eddie would pop in every once in a while because he had just had Wolfgang. The Wolfgang was a, okay. I think Wolfgang might have been, um, I don't know, two, three months old, maybe four mm -hmm. months old. And so he was still married to Valerie and uh, Wolfgang was in one of those little knapsacks hanging in front of Eddie, you know, right here. And there's a little baby and he'd come up, you know, smoking, always smoking with the baby right here. <laughs> And uh, and that's how we got to meet him. And and we spent time um, hours sitting on the couch with him. And sometimes Alex was there. And it was just a really surreal situation to where you got to the point where t t it wasn't that big of a deal when he walked in the room because I mean, let me fix that. He, it was always a big deal because it was it was our hero, so to speak. But it was sort of normal at some point because we right. were up there for months, months in that studio. Yeah. yeah all summer of that year. Uh, I think it was, I want to say 91. And they were preparing their, their new tour, you know, cause they were going to go out on that record, um, carnal knowledge. And, yeah. uh, and we were trying to get our record done because it was a good chance that if we got it done in time, we could go out as support, but you know, things took a long time and, and the record was just, you know, kind of taking a while and, um, and it was, it, we just missed that window, which, you know, is, is, is sort, sort of the story of wild sides career, just missing that window. And, yeah. um, and we continued to miss those windows along the way, but that, that was an amazing, you know, amazing summer and spending a lot of time with, um, you know, sort of our, our hero and, um, and, and getting all of that, recorded i think earlier when i said you know it it sounds like it was a great idea i think maybe in retrospect it might have been um the worst idea in the world because when you know someone like that walks in the room you don't just keep working you stop what you're doing right and yeah. you 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 want to sit and talk and he's a big talk he loves to talk you know <laughs> and and he wants to hear about the record and he wants to hear about the songs and he tells us what's going on and we're fascinated you know and we sit for yeah. hours and unfortunately andy johns the producer was a major alcoholic and drug addict and we were you know happy to join in on any kind of <laughs> drugs that were going on and so we were all sitting around including eddie doing I, I can't even tell you hours all night long, you know, right. And nothing was getting done. And yeah. so what, what should have taken a few weeks up at Eddie's house took months. And those months were crucial months because what was happening in the background is bands like um, Nirvana were setting up to release a record, exactly. another, another record, a major record. And we didn't know it, you know, and we were too busy getting high and waiting for our big moment and missing those crucial windows that we should have been able to wrap up much faster. So maybe that was a, a bad move on our part, although a great um, 
moment and experience. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that is, that is kind of like a double-edged sword there. It's like, you do get to meet one of the rock heroes of all time Yeah. or, you know, but you, you just never know. You just never know. But that's an amazing story. <laughs> I'm sure that was a crazy experience and awesome yeah. experience. But yeah. uh, it, but that's just how it how it's kind. That's like a lot of bands from like the '91 to '93 era just got blindsided by what eventually came to be from Seattle. And yeah. uh, but we can get to that in a, in a short short period here. But uh, so you didn't go on tour with Van Halen like you guys hoped that you could have. You did go on tour with like the Four Horsemen, Babylon AD, which I I really enjoy their debut album. Okay. And their second album as well. And then Roxy Blue as well, which all th three of those bands, uh, I have all of their stuff and are really, really class, good, high class bands that I enjoy. And uh, can you kind of like delve into like which one was kind of like the most fun to go out with? Which band was the most fun to go out with on tour? You know, um, that's a tough call because when you're a young band like we are, um, like we were, um, when you first embark on that, that first, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to go out here and, and play in front of, you know, people around the country rather than just your friends and your family in Hollywood, you know, mm -hmm. cause, cause we built a huge crowd of, of people, but we, we knew most of them and, and guys, <laughs> all the other musicians in, in, a, in all the local bands and all the, all the other, um, you know, even the signed artists that lived in LA would come and hang out and watch us play when we played in LA, but to go out in front of, you know, you know, just raw fans or people that didn't even know us yet. We were excited about that. We wanted them to hear our music and we wanted to play for them. And so that was the first tour we went out with, which was um, the four horsemen. And we didn't know who they were. We didn't know the first thing about these guys. <laughs> and um, we had a, we had a deadhead, ride from LA to um somewhere in in like east east Canada so okay. we had to cross the entire country without playing an entire gig wow. but on a on a on a in those days we were on an RV so it wasn't even a tour bus yet we was yeah. just in an RV you know like struggling to get there and lots of RV breakdowns and problems and right. trying, you know, with our, with our small little road crew and our, we were pulling a trailer with our gear and uh, we finally made it across the border and into Canada and um, hooked up with, um, I think we missed the first show because we were so fucked up from, you know, not, not, not get broken down equipment and shit like that. Right. And we, yeah. and we finally got there and, uh, meeting up with those guys it was weird because those guys were serious musicians too and they were but they were they were um not necessarily a hollywood band you know and they had right. a lot of experience i think the singer was the only guy or maybe there was a couple of the guys that that didn't have the the full tour experience but i know um it was different because la had this vibe that was you know party rock all the time mm -hmm. everything was party rock and we met those guys. It wasn't a party. It was like, yeah, step back and and learn. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, and we and we did. We kind of watched them and kind of figured out what was going on. And then they came out and saw us play. And I remember a couple of times them standing in the crowd and they were tripping. Yeah. Because I'm we sure. weren't we weren't just some you know fly by night scenario. And and we were really serious too. And we made great friends with those guys um that's awesome and it, you know i think a few of those guys have have gone away you know have passed away uh mm -hmm. the drummer the drummer i think died early on not long after we were out there on the road with them and then the, the same thing with the singer but um i still have their cd yeah i play the four horsemen all the time i'm yep. if i'm on my um you know i write a, a harley or, or or whatever i'm doing something like that i will crank up the four horsemen because i think that i well because we spent so much time with their music of course, on the road yeah. you know i got to know everything really you know it was like i could hear the songs in my head i i, <laughs> I love listening to their uh their music off my uh my phone so it's great yeah uh tell me something good or uh, something it's like the final track off that album is really really good i, I enjoy that uh that, that whole album is really good and like you said it's not 
it's still fun rock, but it's not necessarily the L.A. party lyrical no. content and stuff. It has a serious Southern side to it. Absolutely. Uh, Rick and, Rubin produced oh. it. It's heavy drums. It's, 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 you know, it's just cool. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, several months later we got home, we re, um, you know, sort of reset and ready to go on what we were calling our first major tour where our record was out mm -hmm. because on the four horsemen album, I mean, uh, tour, we hadn't released a record yet. It was just, we're not going to release your album until May. Another major mistake, another window mm -hmm. missed. Right. right. But you guys need to get on the road because this was in January. And so we just, we, we went out on the road without having product out there for anyone to buy, which was weird. That's but we tough. did it. We wanted to do it because we wanted to uh, sort of get good at touring. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we went out with, um, Roxy Blue and, um, and Babylon AD and the um, Babylon AD was the, um, you know, was, was supposed to be like the, they were the, the main the, act. The headliner. Okay. And then we were rotating between who's going to be, you know, middle or opening act between the two. So one night we would open another night, it would be Roxy Blue. And okay. we made great friends with those guys because we shared a tour bus. So there was all of us on one bus. <laughs> And we went out there and talk about party rock. Those guys from are from Memphis and um, those guys are not a party. Yeah. So, so we had a really good time. We became best of friends and um, I'm still uh, friends with um, several of those guys today. So it was, it was a good, it was a good run. Good. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that you guys are still like in touch and that you guys, that you guys weren't, enemies because you guys were trying to be better than one. Of, you, you obviously are trying to be better than each other respectfully though. Like it it's wasn't a, just a friend, friendly competition. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So after the tour and such, uh, it seems to be that, you know, the grunge, the, uh, the stuff from Seattle came down and just tore everything apart, sadly and stuff. And I, I kind of wanted to, before we get to your second album, which came out in 95, uh, what was kind of the Sunset Strip like in, say, like the 92, 93, maybe 94 times time frame? Because, like, what, there were still good bands like Alley Cat Scratch out, like, out there. But, obviously, was it still, like, a, a, a strong fan base in the L.A. scene? Uh, but just the record sales were just done. You know, like, just the overall popularity for hair metal was done. Was there still a scene though in 93, 94 in LA? You know, I, an interesting thing happens like when you, when you get your record deal and you go out on the road and you start working, you know, because you, you become a working act and you, you don't have a lot of time to go and hang out in the bars and go see, you know, all these, as you said, you know, the scene. Mm -hmm. it, there's no there's no time and we we were making it a point to stay on the road we if we weren't we, if we weren't working on you know something else we were on the road so that pretty much meant we were on the road all the time and um so from about that point in 92 i mentioned all the way through i want to say 96 there wasn't a whole lot of time to do anything else and so but i mean we were aware of what was going on obviously with the changes in the music at that, you know, you're talking about 94, 95, you know, but all, a lot of the stuff happening in Hollywood was, you know, all the nineties bands were playing those clubs. So, okay. so, so now, now those clubs, like I mentioned, those clubs were all becoming nineties acts clubs, you know, it's still rock. Everybody's still going, it's crowded, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it wasn't the, the Hollywood party metal, you know, right. stuff going on. It was, it was a different kind of crowd, you know, atmosphere. Di different atmosphere, different bands. And then as you crossed over into two thousands, um, all of it changed. Yeah. Yeah. It was completely <laughs> over. And, uh, some of the clubs just went away. They just folded up, yep, and went away, exactly. they cha changed their name or went away. And, uh, and it's interesting because today the scene is, um, it's 
Yeah, I don't think it exists. I, I you know, I did an interview today um, for our magazine, Penthouse Magazine. I, I, I'm doing an interview. I'm doing a story on iconic women in rock. Okay. And so I did an interview today. I was in your chair <laughs> doing the interview and someone else was on the other side. Um, it wasn't a live video. It was, a, it was a recorded phone call so that we can do a story, you know, for mm -hmm. the right. magazine. Right. Um, and it was with, um, Orianti. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. So I did an interview with her and the interesting thing with her is that, um, well, besides that, she, we, we both made a note that there's no scene. I mean, it's very small. It's very different. It's very diverse now. Right. Um, Hollywood isn't where people go anymore. West Hollywood to go see music anymore. Mm -hmm. Most of that's happening in Nashville now. So that's what I hear. That's yeah. yeah Nashville's a hot spot now. It seems. Yeah. It, Nashville couldn't be more like Hollywood in the eighties than any other place in the country. It is exactly like that. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can walk up and down Broadway and hop into any bar and it's going off. Yeah. Wait, now yeah. I would imagine that would be blues, country, even some like rock thrown in there, like a it's, lot of different stuff. Ton of rock. Obviously, there's country on the classic clubs. You know, there's clubs mm -hmm. that stay true. Right. But there's a ton of rock. A lot of bands coming out of there that play kind of you know rock with country rock kind yeah, of thing okay. going on. So, yeah. But uh, it's changed. Uh, Hollywood is not what it used to be, and I don't think that there's a raw um music scene like there used to be when we were coming up right yeah yeah that's a shame it sucks because like i every time i talk <laughs> to somebody that was an artist through that time frame and and just for because I, I i think of it first as a fan because obviously i am a fan of the 80s style uh hair metal like it it, it had to have sucked so much for fans to live through that to see like your scene just totally die out like the party just end it's three o'clock in the morning and the cops are here basically and then i can only imagine that it's 10 times worse for artists that tried to make it uh, make a living at doing that and just totally have to look for different a field of work or try to just change like what they did it I, i'm it just sounds like hell yeah no it was uh i think i mentioned like <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I was really lost and, and really, um, depressed and really, um, I didn't know how to deal with it. I was too mature to figure out what to do after I just put my whole life in, in the hands of other people that, right. you know, so rather than just get strong and say, okay, look, I got a million connections. I know everybody. I can just, let's pause, let's rethink this and come from a, a more, you know, a, a business side and, and try to come at it and, 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 you know, maybe rethink how I'm going to stay in the game. Um, I got, I got, you know, I got depressed and found myself in, in the hands of the wrong people and just got lost right. and, and, and unfortunately lost a lot of precious time because as I said, you know, you wake up one day and you go, what, what, what couch am I on? And how did I get here? Yeah. Many years go by and Scary then stuff. it gets yeah. kind of like, how do I go back to what all that time was that I lost? So. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you did mention, talk briefly about uh, at the opening of the show. So yeah, we don't have to harp too much on that. And yeah, we, we don't, we don't like to be depressed. We like our music isn't depressing. So let's not, let's not dwell on the bad times. That's over, you know? So we, let, let's so you're here in roughly 94 now uh work at, went to an independent label and then you picked up uh a new guitarist from uh the graveyard train actually uh bruce yeah uh, a very this is a very very good album i love this album as well uh sad but for the same thing for them came out in 93 way too late uh no matter how good an album is if it's just too late like you said it misses the window it misses the window and then you guys ended up releasing here in 95 your second album and you know I, I i will praise your debut album to no end but when i first bought that like a couple months after i bought the under the influence i'm like yeah you were like what is this, this is what is this this is what i'm trying to get away from and yeah you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah no i know like just like go into like 
your guys' mindset, like in retrospect, do you think that was a total mistake to have like that kind of sound or you just wanted to take that chance and just see what stick? You know, if you don't evolve, then it's difficult to keep doing what you're doing. You know, you have to evolve. You have to try some things. And um, I think the mistake wasn't necessarily the music. I think the mistake was trying to crowbar the name Wildside into that that sound because Wildside had a sound and a style and a and a, and a, and a you know a genre of life. music and yeah. you know and to to uh, so we had uh, an opportunity to make this other uh, you know make another record with a small indie label. They were sort of all for us, you know. Let's let's do this under a, a different band name and. Um, and that's where we found Bruce and we were, you know, actually Bruce was, um, had been in a band previous to graveyard train with Jimmy, my, my drummer. Okay. So they were friends and, um, that's how we, you know, brought Bruce into the group, but Bruce was nothing like Brent or anything like, I mean, he, his whole thing was like more like Jimmy page, you know, like right. a, just a whole different thing. More, more know, of a bluesy style, I would say. Really, uh, really bluesy. Yeah. And, um, you know, his whole thing was uh, nothing to do with, you know, big Marshall stacks and, um, you know, uh, a flying V guitar. No, yeah. I mean, he was more, you know, into a, a Telecaster and, and, a, and a really different sound. So as we started to write music, it all started to come together and I was enjoying doing something different and really using my voice instead of, you know, a lot of that, you know, shrilling, you know, kind of screaming stuff that right. wild side has, I mean, it's all controlled and it was, it was fun, but I was, um, I was trying to do something else and shouldn't have called it wild side. So that may be the one regret should, should have came up with something else, but the label was like, no, I mean, we want to use the band's fan base in order to sell more records. And I, I'm like, bad idea yeah. so so unfortunately you know we went out on the road for three months in support of that no one wanted to hear that we played all the old stuff and yeah, of yeah. course you know bruce was having a tough time making it sound that way you know because he didn't have that kind of sound very much right. and yeah. so it didn't quite sound right um and and the record company went out of business while we were in the middle of the tour and everything just started to fold up and coming back like i said it would have been a nice idea to think rethink it and and go forward from there but that's how that whole thing kind of came together i i go back and listen to some of those songs now and and, and unfortunately it was mixed really poorly so it's hard to hear the vocal right and when you um if you were to you know figure out how to you know remix that or or just re-record the vocal you'd end up with a really interesting record because the lyrics are really really interesting and um it's got some good hooks to it and you know we've come mm. a long way from you know just one singular sound we were trying to do something else so yeah i i can i can say like like i said like i don't put this album on a whole lot but like I haven't probably listened to this album for a couple of years, but like just looking through the track listings, I can still remember what disposable sounds like. I can still remember what full circle sounds like. Right. Uh, it like, like to your point, uh, I think if it was produced a little mixed a little bit better, there might've been something there, you know, there might've been mm -hmm. a little bit, but it would have been a more enjoyable listen. But like, like you said, the lyrical content is still, is still top notch. So it, it's still worth a listen, especially for someone that, isn't going to be shell shocked if they don't get another type of under the influence, if you will. Well, yeah. And a lot of people that are discovering, you know, wild side today, if somebody says, go check it out, they, they aren't looking at it so singularly like, oh, I like this one. And uh, what did they do here? You know, it, it, mm -hmm. you know, cause music has been, you know, you can, in today's world everything is blurred all those lines are blurred it's not yes. I either like this or i don't like you know or, or i like that and you know, people people are very diverse they listen to lots of different music now mm -hmm. and they can be into different music and it's not so 
so uh, singular, and it used to be much more singular. You know, like I'm into Maiden, and that's yeah, all yeah. I listen to. Slayer, you yeah, know, Slayer and, and, only. <laughs> yeah, and so um, you know, so you, I, I you know, I, that's the only thing that I think you know with when it comes to anybody that's trying to listen to you know both our records. Right. Yeah. And just listen to both of them with an open mind as well. I think, and that's with any band and even any record from any band, uh, just with an open mind, wh however you feel, listen to it. That's all that matters at the end of the day. It doesn't matter. If you, the interesting thing is if you go, if you, if you listen to under the influence and obviously all the songs are about girls and cars and, and drugs and good times and, we're gonna yep. we're gonna drink till we fall under the table and, and everything and good is, ballads good ballads great, as well great, on there good, good ballads all really commercial you know rock and then you listen to the self-titled record mm -hmm. it's really dark correct it's really really moody it's uh, it's it's depressing and if you really pay attention and read the lyrics in the booklets if, if that you know if you get that um you'll see that i was trends you know I, I was moving into different you know sort of tra chapter of my life where right. that was clearly you know right on the edge yeah and uh, you explaining like your life through uh you know through the 80s and up until the 2000s even how you said it earlier in the show th this album makes more sense then with yeah. lyric lyrical content, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's just what you guys were kind of going through. And I yeah. can, I can totally imagine that too, just having kind of going back to this point of like your scene being taken away, just dying. So it's like, you guys are kind of just like, what do we kind of do now? And yeah. your points earlier. So I yeah. totally get that. But I, obviously just, you know, look at it in hindsight, it's like, damn, we could have had another, you know, could have had another one of these masterpieces yeah. here, yeah, but yeah. It, 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 it is what it is. Like, Cause that's, for every other band in the early 90s late 80s there wasn't I, I always say this to everybody there wasn't a bad band i don't think in the late 80s early 90s like all you guys were pumping out great great stuff uh and i think everyone like you said earlier friendly competition it, it everybody was good so everyone had to you know put 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 it up a notch right on so yeah so drew uh do you do you have anything else to say to the fans? I don't want to, I we're coming up here on air. I don't want to waste any, your, any more of your time uh, talking about, you know, the past, but uh, anything else you want to shout out to the uh, followers? No, you here? know, um, obviously the music's available everywhere. You can stream. I mean, everywhere as well as download, if that's your thing, or, um, you know, you can go and, break your wallet and buy it on eBay because it's not cheap. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so check out the music. It's great. I, I think it still holds up. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot, there's a live album version of some of the stuff that you can get as well. You know, it says you can stream it and um, all kinds of demos and different little, you know, there's videos on YouTube. So if you haven't, you know, checked it out i i think it's a lot of fun to watch um and then like i mentioned the 80s 80s metal recycle bin which is the show that i do with uh jimmy which mm -hmm. is our you know our interview channel that we have on youtube yeah check it out it's a lot of fun and um tons of videos uh, of all the different you know all your your 80s metal heroes they're all there mm -hmm. and um so yeah that's it. I mean, I appreciate the time and, and I, uh, it's a fun show. Yes, uh, sir. So cool. Hey, you're, you're welcome back anytime to talk any kind of music and talk more, any Van Halen, uh, stories or wild side stories. Uh, we're more than happy to have you Drew. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming on the show again. So this has been a, a little, a little, uh, bucket list of mine that, you know, one of my favorite high school bands get to talk to. So cool, man. Cool. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, guys, check out Wild Side there. Uh, there's the boys there from the late 80s, early 90s. Check out Under the Influence and also their 95 self-titled self album. Uh, guys, if you like what we're doing here on Crash Course Metal Show, give us a subscribe. Leave a comment here. Say hi to Drew. Uh, give us a like. And, guys, I want to thank you all the viewers for watching and until next time i'm trevor crash knight and that's drew from wild side and we will see you guys later yeah i wrote that
that. It's called, I want to rock your body. And then in parentheses, it says, to the break of dawn.